next we have uh, Noah Linsky, who is a last-minute addition to this. Noah is uh, one of the best presenters I've seen on uh, simple visualization and thoughts about how to communicate things. Uh, the last time I saw him present, he uh, used a complex visualization tool to decide what bicycle tires he should buy. Um, and if that doesn't tell you that he overthinks things, nothing will. Um, Noah is going to talk to us about design thinking for effective data visualization. Noah. Hi. Thanks very much. So I'm going to dive right in. All right, I have a, keep a good welcoming slide here, um, just in case, uh, folks, if you want to follow me, my Twitter handle is at the bottom, Noah I, and um, I'll be talking at Strata, Strata. Uh, on the same topic, um, actually doing a tutorial where you can bring your own data or work with some data that I'll provide and actually go through this process during the tutorial. So if this is exciting, that's an even more exciting opportunity. So uh, the good news here in terms of this doing visualization design is that it's, if you're already writing software, if you're already building systems, you're already doing design and you already have some sense whether you've got formal training or not, you already have some sense about how to do design. Um, there's a process which you're consciously or unconsciously aware of. Uh, you're going to have some goals whether you're building a data center or uh, coding something, specking an API, whatever it is, you're going to have some goals that are going to um, drive the design of, of what you're doing. So. Uh, in the same way, you can think of visualization being just another, um, another product that you are creating and the design that goes into anything else, those same principles can go into the process of doing visualization design. There are a few gotchas, there's some, there's some science behind it that's, that's unique to visualization, but um, we're going to touch on that. So, it comes down to essentially two phases. The first one that I find doesn't get enough conversation and we're going to dwell on just a little bit today is deciding what to visualize. And <clears throat> this is a little bit tricky because um, uh, the data is really exciting and, and we get a bunch of data, nine terabytes or whatever, in front of us and we say, this is awesome, we're going we're gonna to visualize it, we're going to graph it. And uh, we bust out the R and do the statistical regressions and, 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 and throw all the graphs up on the screen, but, but without having a, uh, a real mission of particularly what we're trying to learn from it, it is difficult to be efficient with what it is that we are actually creating and visualizing. So um, the whole first part, phase one, is figuring out what it is to visualize. The phrase that you'll hear a lot is telling stories with data and the reason that, that people use the phrase telling stories is because the story gives context. The story sort of informs the meaning and tells us why we're here. In any case, you got to know what you're doing first. And then the second part, how to visualize, how to take the data that you've got and to put it on the page or on the screen in a meaningful, rational way that your audience or your reader or your customer is going to be able to understand. So. <clears throat> Uh, diving in, so there's three main inputs when you're, when you're doing a data visualization um, and the sequence of these is not set in stone. Uh, I put reader sort of top and center because I think that's uh, an aspect that, that we don't talk about quite enough um, and I'm going to not talk about it quite enough right now because Bitsy going to talk more about it right after me. In any case, uh, there's three inputs. There's, there's your reader, your audience, your customer, your investor, your boss, whoever it is that's going to consume this creation that you're that you're building. Now, it might just be you, it might be the rest of your team, but somebody is going to use this thing. You yourself have goals, and if you are not the ultimate consumer of this, um, you, there's a reason that you're, you're doing the motivation. Now, at the, at the early part of the, of the game, that motivation is probably going to be, let me see what's here in my data. I need to understand my data a little bit better. But as you, as you move through that and you have a good sense of what's in your data and your job becomes one of conveying it to somebody else, uh, then you need to focus a little bit what that message is going to be and you need to have a, a clear sense of what it is you're communicating. And finally, the data itself has some form. There's different data types and that's, I mean, you can almost, uh, you can almost treat it like you're, like you're um, speaking out a database design where you're talking about different, different shapes and flavors of data. So let's talk about your goals to begin with. These are just sort of the basic questions you want to ask yourself. Why are you here? What are we attempting to do? Are we, are we trying to compare values? Are we going to show changes or trends? Uh, is there a timeline aspect going on? Are there gaps we're looking for? Are there outliers we're looking for? Um, what are we trying to see? What are we trying to represent in the data? 
data relationships matter. We want to know if there's a correspondence between um, two different dimensions of our data. We want to know if there are seasonal changes in the sales. We want to know if different parts of the country are, are using our service at different rates relative to the populations. So understanding what those relationships you're looking for is a really good place to start. And finally, at the end of the day, you want to be able to, in a really clear way, um, talk about what does success look like? What questions can we answer? What actions can we take? And actually, credit where credit is due, some of, some of the, the insight um, for this as a bullet item came from a conversation I had with Alistair at one point. And I was, I was talking about the real goal being, what information are we trying to reveal? And he said, it's more than that. It's then what do we do with it? And so I've adopted that. So thanks for that. So that's you. You have to know your goals. You have to know why you're there to make this a relevant presentation to some audience. The audience, they also have needs. And these are going to look, this, this bullet item list is going to look very similar to, um, to the question of your goals, but they are different from you. Uh, they also are going to be here and they have some work that they need to get done, uh, some information that they need to learn or some insight that needs to be given to them so that they can get their work done. So what are they attempting to do? How is the audience different from us? That is a really important thing that also does not get addressed enough, I think, when we're talking about interfaces and information deliverables, um, particularly if there are uh, cultural differences, language differences, uh, political biases, uh, different levels of education, different levels of technological familiarity, jargon, all these things. So um, jargon, how much time do they have? How, how motivated are they? What are their biases, hopes, and dreams? Um, this, is sort of the, this is sort of the fundamental UX background that, that if you were designing a product or an interface and you went out to research who your customers were going to be, the sort of thing that you'd want to know so that you can satisfy their needs. And again, finally, if we're successful, what questions can my audience answer? Um, or my, if you don't like the word audience, think about the word customer or investor, uh, if that gives you a little more appropriate context. Um, and particularly, what actions can they take? What are we empowering by, by presenting them this particular data? So, and then finally, the data itself. The data's got some form. So uh, again, going back to the bike wheel, just because I love it, it's a, it's a lovely little example. There's a wheel size, which is you know, how, how big the wheel is relative to the bicycle, and there's a few standards. And so that may be numeric data because the standards are measured, but really it's a category. It's not, uh, it's, you can't infinitely vary the size of the bike wheel. There's only a couple that you can go out and buy. So there's categorical data. Um, tire width. That's an important thing, and that's you can have a skinny, fast tire or a, or a wider tire that's more suited to off-road things, and all these other sort of um, uh, factors and characteristics of the tire that are going to be interesting for you as a shopper. So understanding the shape of your data, understanding what relationships are there, and understanding the data types is key. So with that whole first part is thinking about your goals, thinking about the data you have, thinking about the message you have, understanding what subset of data you want to visualize, and now you get to the design stage. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this chart. You can download it on my blog at Complex Diagrams. I have a nice PDF that looks just like this. But the message I want to get across on this chart, and, and like I said, we'll, you can get into it on your, on your own time, but um, the point here, the key takeaway is that different visual properties are better or worse for different data types because different visual properties are um, ordered or not ordered in terms of how the brain perceives them. They have larger or small numbers of uh, usable variations. Um, some of them are good for quantitative encoding. Some are not good for quantities. Some are good for um, categorical encoding. Some are not as good for categories. So understanding which encodings to use is, a, is a, an important key part of it. And this is a thing that you learn with experience. And this, um, this all comes out of the research uh, from cognitive psych and perception um, that goes back many decades. But um, print this out and stick it up on your wall when you're, uh, when you're doing designs. I'm going to focus on just two of these because these are very tricky ones that are very important. The first one, your axes define the world. Uh, one of the greatest tragedies, I think, in data visualization is, is people don't use axes effectively or they don't pick them very well. You've got to pick your axes first because that literally defines the scope of your visualization. It defines what it is that you're talking about and how it can be used. Uh, you take a look at Hipmunk. If you haven't used Hipmunk, you should go check out hipmunk.com. Looks like um, 
it looks just like this. You, you search for a flight and it shows you all the available flight times and there's a phenomenal amount of information encoded simply by the placement of those flights. Now you'll notice that each flight, it doesn't have a start time and an end time label, it doesn't have a duration label. You can get those things if you mouse over or click on the flight. But just by sheer proximity, by sheer placement of where it is on those well-defined horizontal axis, you can see which flight's a little bit longer, which flight's a little bit shorter, what time of day they take off and land, whether or not there's a stopover and how long the stopover is. Phenomenal amount of information. And because the information is, is so well-defined in that horizontal axis, they have actually have the ability to use their vertical axis for something else. In this case, they call it a sort by agony, uh, which is a composite of time of day and price and some other things. So really excellent, masterful use of well-defined axes that um, allows them to have a fairly clean looking interface and still convey a huge amount of knowledge. So placement, uh, most, most flexible and most powerful uh, visual encoding uh, and is really what you want to think about first and, and define it in such a way that you can reveal your most important relationship with it. Next most important thing, color is not ordered. It's great for categories, it's really terrible for ranking. So um, this map, the joke I make about this map is it shows that the Alps are really hot. No, of course not. This is not a temperature map, it's an altitude map, but it shows you that there, it, it's very difficult to get an inherent uh, sense of what color means, and particularly when it's cycling through this rainbow spectrum. My other pet peeve of this map, if you look at the scale on the side, the key there, um, the high altitudes are down at the bottom of the scale and the low altitudes are up at the top of the scale. It would have been very simple for them to flip that axis on that scale and make it a smidgen more accessible. So, so what do you do if you want to show uh, gradations in altitude or temperature or things like this? Well, for altitude, a really good way to do it is to vary either brightness or saturation. So this is a much better altitude kind of a map. They've also done the same thing um, wrong with the uh, vertical axis. But, but what you can see here is that rather than cycling through a rainbow to show you what the altitude is like, you get instead um, a lighter and, and, and darker and the range, the spectrum in between all along that same shade of from, from, from that sort of pale tan through orange and dark brown. So you have a much better sense of looking at this map and being able to say, aha, this is a darker color than that paler color. I understand that it's higher up. On the prior map, if somebody says, here's a yellow country and here's a purple country, you have to go look at the scale. There's no way to remember on the top, off the top of your head. There's no intuitive way to say purple is bigger than yellow. So that's the very brief preview of the kind of thing we're going to be getting into at Strata. Um, the, uh, the workshop will go into much more depth and like I said, I'll, I'll bring some data sets and please bring your own data set if you come to my workshop and we'll actually go through this process of determining what story to tell, what data to use for it, who you're trying to make happy and the story you're trying to um, convey to that audience and then we'll go through this process of picking encodings. Uh, also, if you're super excited by this kind of thing, um, there's two books. I, I co-wrote uh, a book called Designing Data Visualizations with Julie Steele, which is exactly this process. It's a, a slim little book that will really get you started. Um, and the other book that we worked together, we co-edited, is a book called Beautiful Visualization, which is uh, 400 pages, full color, beautiful, um, 20 chapters of case studies of really interesting different visualization problems that have been done, uh, solved and, and, and built by different teams and all different technologies and all different ways. So that's uh, a really fun source book to flip through. And um, I think I am running up on my time barrier, so that's what I got. And uh, if there is a question or two, um, if we have time for that. Well, no, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is Alistair. So one quick question for you. Um, you mentioned the HipMonk Hip interface, and I think you kind of um, provided your own best example that they call the axis agony. Nobody yeah. would think of calling it agony unless they were heavily focused on the end user's actual problem, which is to solve travel with the least agony. But the fact that they can yeah. call the metric that the key performance indicator they've rolled everything up into and call it agony shows an incredible amount of audience focus in their in their creation of the graph, right? That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And 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 you know, just by if, if you go use it, you'll see there's there's so many things that they've done right on this interface. And and don't get me wrong, I've used Kayak for a long time, and I love Kayak. But when you go look at Hitmonk, it's really the next generation, and you can tell that they set out to very intentionally create a different sort of experience. And there are so many things that they've done to make it an audience focused, just really made to optimize the experience for their customer and give their customer a good experience. And it, it's reflected in all the things that they do. So that agony and using that label on the axis is just one example. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a very different sort of experience and, and people who have not used it I think will really enjoy playing with it a little bit.
Okay, uh, one quick question for you uh, from Venkatesh Rao, um, and I tend to agree with him on this one. Why do so many people have Tufti's books proudly displayed on their bookshelves but never actually crack open and read the damn things? Uh, uh, a quick two-part answer. Um, uh, one is because they got sent to the workshop and they enjoyed the workshop and they got the books and they brought them home and put them on the shelf and then they kind of flipped through them. Um, the other part, and, and uh, this is the tricky part, there's lots of good information in Tufti, there's lots of tips and tricks, but there's no process. And uh, if you already are pretty good at what you're doing or you have a nice sense of this graph and what its goals are and, and how to encode things and what your axes are, then you can read the Tufty and, and you can make some changes to your typography and your labeling a little bit. But I, I kind of feel like the, the Tufty is, is more sort of tips and tricks and cleaning up around the edges and it's less um, useful as an instructional source for, for really how to do it. And so, I, I mean, I see the same thing, people ranting online, how come these people didn't read Tufty when they drew this graph? And the answer is, even if they did, I don't think Tufty gives people a solid enough foundation in the process and the thinking about things other than sort of saying, do it right, more data, less ink, which is a nice mantra, but it's not very instructional. And I think, um, I think people need uh, more practice at actually going through this, the, the process, much, much like we just did, thinking about what story are they trying to tell, what data can they throw away, what data can they really highlight. Um, so it's a little bit of a deeper question than, than how come they haven't read the books. It's, it's the answer is the books aren't quite the right answer either. Sure. Okay. Uh, one quick last question. Um, Marty Langdon was asking, do you have any plans for an online workshop? I mean, it sounds like a lot of people would like to just say, can you look at my graph and fix it for me, please? Sure. Uh, well, so I'm, I am actually doing an online workshop, um, a virtual seminar uh, next Thursday, the 2nd, for UIE, um, User Interface Engineering. It's a user experience consultancy out of Boston that does some fantastic work. So I'll be doing uh, a similar thing to what I'm doing at Strata, um, taking some data and walking through the process of, of doing a design with that data um, online on uh, February 2nd. Uh, beyond that, I don't have any online workshops scheduled. Okay, cool. Well, it sounds like there's certainly some demand for that stuff. Uh, thank you very much for jumping in the last minute. Uh, for those of you on the call, uh, I think Noah agreed to do this yesterday afternoon when we had a last minute uh, cancellation from one of our speakers. So, uh, as always, um, prepared and to the point, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today, Noah. You're welcome. I had a lot of fun. Talk to you soon.